Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Now you listen to me, David Norton. You can't help being in this hospital, and you're going to be here several days more, so you might as well just sit back and enjoy it. I'll sit back, and I'll even lie back, but I won't enjoy it. Honestly, just because you're stubborn. Well, did you enjoy being in the hospital when you had the baby? I loved it. Ho, 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 ho. I did, too. <laughs> All the lovely attentions I received, nurses running in and out. Mm. And they didn't make half as much fuss about me as they did about you because you just happened to be a man. That's such a bad-looking one, that. You don't have to flatter my ego. I'm not. Any other day you'd agree with me, only today you're in a bad humor. Mm, well, you'd be in a bad humor, too. You are a fine sport, you are. I am. All you have is a silly little broken collarbone and hangover from a concussion. You ought to be very grateful. Well, if that's all I have, why can't I go home? Oh, darling, I hate you to be in the hospital, but I just keep knocking wood that you are. Could have been so much worse. It shouldn't have happened in the first place. Well, it wasn't your fault. The other man skidded into you. And he's dead. David, it wasn't your fault. No, I know it wasn't. You don't have to keep telling me. The fact remains that he's dead, and it's not a nice thing to think about. David, you're... You're not going to brood about it, are you? Why, why shouldn't I? A, a little anyway. Because you're not the brooding kind of a man. Only hens brood, and you're a rooster. Yeah, one sock dollager of a rooster. Oh, shut up. Now, that's a nice way to talk to me, a bed-ridden convalescent. Well, it's the only way you deserve being talked to, complaining because you have to spend a few days in this this lovely sunny room, being pampered and spo- and the rest will do you good. Mm, I'm not tired. Maybe you would be if you weren't in bed. Well, that's one way of looking at it. As a matter of fact, you look so comfortable, I almost wish I were here, too. If you were, I wouldn't mind so much. Now, that was sweet. Well, am I not always sweet? So-so. Mm, if I could turn over, I'd show you something beautiful. The nurse said I have the most stunning black and blue marks between my shoulders. The shape of South America. Oh? South America's a lovely shape. Mm, we'll have to go there someday. You just get well. That's all I care about. And Mama and the baby and Fritz and Bertha, it's all they care about, too. Have you spoken to Roger today? Oh, yes, mm, just before coming over. What did you say? He says uh, everything at the office is going on fine. He's managing beautifully. Aren't you pleased? Yeah, delighted. There's nothing like being dispensable. Now, Roger didn't mean it that way, and you know it. I suppose not. I'm glad he's managing without me. Hurts, doesn't it? Well, how would you like it if, if I told you everything at home was going beautifully when you weren't there? You do tell me. You tell me that all the time. Yeah, it's, it's different with a man. Yes, everything's always different with a man. David, listen, you should hear how the telephone at home rings all day. People from all over Eastbrook telephoning to find out how you are. People I didn't know even know we knew. Know we knew. Mm-hmm. Let's go back and try that again. Now, let's see. People, people that I, didn't I know. never knew. Yeah, that, I knew That's all right. Before. Forget it. Now, that's nice. Okay. I'm glad. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you get the idea. David, listen. Do you want me to bring you any books to read or some pickled calves' feet, maybe? Sick people always eat pickled calves' feet. I wonder why. I'm not sick, and I don't like pickles calves' feet, and I can't set up yet, and it's sort of difficult to read books. So maybe tomorrow. You'll be home before you know oh, it. Oh, sure. Car's still at the garage. Man says we'll have it next week. I guess I can't tell you anymore not to, not to drive so recklessly. I guess I won't have a leg to stand on. Not a leg? I guess from now on, you're the boss at the wheel. Now, that's a bright thing for you to be saying. Very brilliant. Mm-hmm. How long have you been driving? Oh, 12, 13 years. How many accidents have you had? One's enough. One little accident that wasn't even your fault in 13 years. That's a pretty good record, I'd say. I haven't even been driving 13 months, so don't you start making pretty speeches about me being a better driver. Am I not allowed to even make pretty speeches? Oh, darling, I love you, and I want you to be happy. Come in. 
Why, Mr. Tucker. Hello there, Mrs. Norton. Hello there, son. Well, this is a surprise. Just thought I'd amble over and give you my howdy duty. Here, uh, here's some posies to Lyle sent. Oh, oh wonderful. I'll take the flowers down the hall, Mr. Tucker. Have them put in a vase. No, oh, they're just some posies. No need to make such a fuss about them. They're beautiful, so stop insulting them. Well, I can't let a lady carry her own bundles. Here, hand them over. If you insist on taking them down the hall, I'll carry them for you. There's no need, really. I can see this gentleman is spoiling you while I'm away. Hand them over, Mrs. Norton. So gallant, Mr. Tucker. Be right back, son. Just escorting your wife down the corridor away. I don't blame you. I'd rather be with Claudia than with me any day. No, not I. I'd rather be with you. I'm tired of being with me. See you, David. Well, I sure handled that pretty smooth, didn't I? (laughs) What do you mean? Well, I aimed to have a private chat with you before I started talking to your husband. Don't think he suspected, though, did he? Even I didn't suspect. Oh, Chivalry is such a natural part of your character, Mr. Tucker. I'll come to the point straight away. How is he? Well, outside of being slightly discouraged, he's fine. But Dr. Barry warned me he'd be a little depressed. You didn't need no doctor to tell you that. No man, if he is a man, likes to be incarcerated in one of these here hospitals. Mm, And David, least of all. Them medicos get you flat on your back as soon as they meet a man close enough to see the whites of his eyes flat on his back he goes. (laughs) Yep. That's why I stay away from them, I do. They'd kill a man with attention, they would. Oh, I I know, I I ain't never gonna let one of them fellas give me the nonsense. I never did see the insides of a hospital till my daddy was brought in to breathe his last. And that was over his dead body, Mm. figuratively. So you said. Yep. I knew the minute he crossed the sanctimonious doors of a hospital, he'd breathe his last. And breathe his last. He did, he did. Well, that certainly is reassuring. Nope, I ain't never let them rob me of my tonsils. I was born with them. I'll die with them. <laughs> well, I guess you better go in and see your husband now. Was that all you wanted to tell me? Just want to see the lay of the land. Mr. Tucker, I, I don't quite know how to tell you, but David is unhappy enough about being in this hospital without speak you. Speak up, speak up. What I mean is he sees all its bad points. What he needs is sort of to... To see the good ones. Oh, there ain't none. Well, I I wish you could think of some. David would listen to them if they came from you, Mr. Tucker. Mrs. Norton, I ain't no hypocrite. Could you just be a little... Pretend the hospital is a fine place for him to be. Nope. Sorry. I couldn't lie that much. Even if it's important? Even if... Well, I I guess I'd better go put these flowers in a vase. I'll be back in a minute. Now, I'll go in and cheer up your husband. Yeah, you... Cheer him up, all right. Well, Mr. Norton, I uh, did me little service to the fair sex, and I'm back. Well, pull up a chair, Mr. Tucker. Ah, uh, must say it sure is something of a surprise to me to see you uh, lie abed this fine fall weather. Yeah, it's something of a surprise to me, too. This, uh, this ain't a bad room, though, it ain't. Got a nice look out that window. Well, I can tell you exactly how many branches there are on that tree, each don't tree. don't say. You know, I was just telling your wife I'm I'm a fool of a man, all right. How come? Well, here I've been going around and priding myself that I ain't never set me foot in the hospital, mm. that I ain't never let no medico incarcerate, I mean, uh, coax me into one of these here places. I was telling her that in all the years I never let anyone take care of me save myself. Well, I think you have the right attitude, Mr. Tucker. Well, uh, Wonder if I do. You know, I, I ain't the young feller I used to be. Oh, go on, Mr. Tucker. You're getting younger every day. Younger from the other end of the yardstick, maybe, but <laughs> now I can feel my joints going rusty and the blood run cooler in my veins. Of course, I ain't done in by a long shot. But I ain't never told this to nobody, but life, life catches up on you, son. It sure does. Well, I wouldn't complain if I were you, Mr. Tucker. I'm a good bit younger than you are. Here I am, flat on my back. Well, you were walking around on your own two legs. I ain't been hit by a car like you, young one. If I had, I'd be laying down, too, but six foot under, yep. I'm thinking maybe since this is the autumn of the year and the autumn for Jared Tucker, maybe I ought to let the old guy get himself looked over. Uh, Dr. Barry, maybe, yep. You look fine to me. You never know. Trees look good on the outside and they're decaying on the inside. It can seem perfectly healthy. And yet parasites will be sucking out its strength. We ain't none of us different from the other. Every now and then we got to get the decaying parasites out of our system. Say, um, what uh, brought all this on, Mr. Tucker? Oh, just thinking. Just thinking as I watch you laying in bed so comfortable, so cool. 
Looking so good and rested. I, I ain't seen you looking so good since first set eyes on you. Well, I don't think I've had so much rest and a lump in my life before. Do you good? Do me good, too, if I had sense for it. Maybe I ought to let myself get hit by a car. No, no, take my advice. <laughs> Trying to force me to slow up a few days, maybe. Even for a couple of weeks. Does man good to set his mind wandering? Nothing else to do but let it dream and think? Yeah, I have an awful lot of time for that. Young man, when I was a boy, I had some sense. I used to lay down on the slope of a hill neath a tree, chewing on a blade of grass, and I used to dream. Just lay there and dream, building castles. Then I started to hopping. I kept right on hopping, still hopping. I look back now, and the best moments in my whole life was when I was laying under that tree with a blade of grass in my mouth and dreaming. Got a half a mind to start dreaming now. Why, a man can be almost anything he wants to be if he gives himself time. I, I saw myself a John Paul Jones once. Another time I dreamed myself an Abe Lincoln. Then, then there was a day when the shape of a cloud was in the form of an elephant. And that day I, I was one of them Indian potentates. Dreaming's a good way of passing time. I guess I've gotten out of the habit. Oh, we all do. We ain't got the sense to cut ourselves out a chunk of time just for dreaming. I hold that when, when there are dreams, when men can believe in them and want to live by them, the world's a better place. We've been hurrying so darn much lately, I, I kind of forgot. That was a mighty good thought, Mr. Tucker. Well, you got a big chance, son. I haven't been looking at it that way. You had a beam in your eye. But you start ruminating and you won't be feeling so sorry for yourself. Yep, now I've got half a mind to rent in your room. Getting myself laid up in one of these here beds, have my meals brung in by the pretty nurses. <laughs> <laughs> All dressed in white and just laying there, staring out the window, <laughs> dreaming and ruminating. Well, you've almost got me convinced, Mr. Tucker. <laughs> Dang if I ain't got myself convinced. Yeah, but I sure do envy you. If when some member of the family wants to have a party, you think it means a lot of extra work for you, here's a suggestion. Instead of making a fuss over company, just get a case of Coke and make no other preparations. Everyone enjoys ice-cold Coca-Cola. And you'll enjoy party giving more if it doesn't ask too much of you in the way of cooking and table setting and dishwashing. Uh. Wait a minute there, Mr. King. Don't say another word. Why, what's the trouble, Mr. Tucker? Oh, nothing's the trouble. I just wanted to have a bit of conversation with you. Oh, I thought you had great news for me. No, nope, nothing important. Say, I, I seen the doctor just now. Mm-hmm. And uh, he says it uh, like is not young David's going to be going home beginning of the week. Oh, that is news. Great news. Think so? I was just convinced by him that a hospital's a fine place to be for a bit of time. Well, did he convince you, or did you convince yourself? Well, guess sort of worked, sort of mutual. Yeah, I guess did. Yeah, I guess I better be toddling. Pigs ain't getting fed this way. Well, see you later, Mr. King. Very soon, Mr. Tucker. As I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again Monday at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. The parts of Claudia and David on this program were played by Catherine Bard and Paul Crabtree, and the entire production is supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. And now here's a word from your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola.